All righty, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. I just got okay to start the show. So uh, really quickly, we're going to be shifting gears. I want to put away these space trivia questions up on the screen because we're going to be transitioning into the unknown. Ooh. And uh, folks, before we begin this show, I just want to introduce myself real quick. My name is Christian. I'm going to be your planetarium presenter. Uh, just out of curiosity for the folks who are here at the planetarium, how many of y'all been to a planetarium before? Show of hands. Ooh, more than half. Faith in humanity restored. How many of y'all have never been to a planetarium before? Show of hands. Ah, welcome newcomers. Planetariums are one of my favorite places to be in this entire planet because everything that you see in purple uh, is going to be one massive screen. So we're going to have a very immersive experience here. And just to let you know, everything that you're about to see is based by actual uh, scientific evidence, critique, peer review. And we also add, like to add a scientific software uh, visualization to give you that very immersive experience. And uh, folks, before we begin, I just want to introduce what we're about to do right now. Uh, we're about to see a show called Tour of the Universe. Essentially what that means, you're going to hear my voice for the next 30 minutes or so. And we're going to start off from Earth and we're going to pull all the way back to the very edge of the known universe. Hopefully by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis, but uh, hey, you never know. <laughs> and uh, before we get started, I got to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page. We can have a great experience inside the Morrison. Uh, first off, there's no food or drinks allowed inside, so if you manage to bring any snacks or beverages, make sure those are tucked away till the end of the show. We want to keep this place nice and clean. Uh, second, uh, please wear your mask while you're inside the planetarium dome. Uh, we do have about 150 people up in here, so again, we want to make sure everyone's safe. So again, please wear your mask. We do appreciate your cooperation. And folks, if you happen to have any cell phones, smartwatches, laptops, beepers, now's the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate them, set up to stun, do whatever you need to to make sure they don't come out of your pockets for the next 30 minutes because having a really bright white light in a very dark room could be distracting for the folks sitting behind you. So we appreciate your help again. And folks, you're more than welcome to exit at any moment during the show. All we ask is that if you do exit, please make your way up the stairs. That's where the exits are going to be located. So when in doubt, always make your way up the stairs, not down them. And folks, this show uh, can be quite immersive. If at any point during the show it becomes too overwhelming, um, you get you become motion sensitive, there's a really quick, easy solution for you. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big, deep breaths. Your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling through space, at least not more than the usual. <laughs> but other than that, it looks like we're good to go. So let's begin the show, folks. All righty, folks. So we're going to be starting off pretty close to Earth. Uh, what we're starting off here is known as the International Space Station, or what we like to call the ISS for short. But essentially, the International Space Station is a collaboration between many nations across planet Earth to pretty much figure out what exactly happens to things in space. So they conduct a lot of different sorts of experiments up here. For example, how do plants grow in a low gravitational orbit? How does a flame uh, act out here? So lots of scientific discoveries in the name of science, one of my favorite places uh, to see. And folks, the International Space Station isn't too far away from planet Earth. It looks quite far. We can see the Earth just below us, but it's only about 225 miles above the surface of the Earth. 225 miles, that's like from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away for the weekend with the family. Hee hee hee. And uh, folks, what's uh, fascinating about the International Space Station is that it's going a an incredibly uh, high speeds. It's traveling at a whopping 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes, where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Woo, how romantic. And folks, this is as, uh, the biggest object we've ever put into orbit around planet Earth. It's about the size of a football field. And it keeps getting bigger every uh, year because they keep adding new compartments to it. And the International Space Station fits about six to 10 astronauts uh, comfortably. But we're going to leave the International Space Station for now because we're going to start to slowly pull away from it. And now it's going to be represented by this nice orange line. We're going to see the International Space Station slowly fade away into the ocean.
And as we're getting a much uh, larger view of our planet, I do want to uh, introduce our software that we're using here. This software is different from the previous softwares that we use on other shows. This is one called Open Space. It's an open source program. Uh, technically, you can download it at home, but I would recommend if you, you need to have a really good processing computer. So if you have a gaming computer or desktop, uh, you can definitely run Open Space on your computers. Just to warn you folks, uh, Open Space is a beta program, which means it's not completely finished, which you may encounter a few bugs or glitches here and there, but that's okay. If we manage to uh, come across any of them in this show, I'll point them out for you. But let's make our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. Now, how many people in this planetarium have been to the moon before? Say yo. I did hear a couple of yo's, and if you did say yo, we have a couple of scientists that want to speak to you after the show. What are you doing in this planetarium show? Hehe. <laughs> but in all seriousness, folks, we humans have been to the moon before. Uh, this was between 19, uh, 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon and play golf here. But don't worry, folks, we humans are planning a return trip back to the moon. NASA has a new space program called Artemis, where they're going to be sending the first woman to the moon. But not only that, they're going to also be uh, setting up a lunar base. So they're going to be practicing how exactly can we build a colony. And one good place to try it out is here on the moon, because it's not too far away from the Earth. I mean, the moon is incredibly far. Here on Earth, it kind of looks like you can stretch out your arms and touch the moon but the moon's incredibly far away. It's about 240,000 miles away. That's about a quarter of a million miles. Now, some of you folks may own a car with that many miles on it, and if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop. Although I cannot recommend it, the roads are poorly maintained. <laughs> Ooh, I can tell this is a good crowd already. <laughs> and uh, folks, from here on now, we're going to need to use a more uh, useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities. So astronomers instead use a more convenient measurement known as light speed. And light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. Now that's about 300,000 kilometers per second. Woo! So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But for now, folks, we're going to leave our moon behind. So everybody say bye-bye, moon. See you later. And now, folks, we're going to be taking another leap into a much greater realm of our solar system. We're going to watch the moon and the Earth and its orbits as they slowly recede. And on our journey, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to the help of computer models showing us the most accurate information and images available to us. And now the nearest star to the Earth, the sun, is about to come into view. Here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. And now we're looking down in our solar system. We have a nice bird's eye perspective. Now, the sun away, uh, is about 93 million miles away from the Earth. So 93 million miles away, whew, that's a good distance away. In order for light to reach us here on Earth, it takes us about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light. So we're the third rock from the sun, so about eight and a half minutes. Now, that's a fascinating concept to keep in mind because if the sun was to turn off all of a sudden, it would take the light to reach us eight and a half minutes. We wouldn't know about it for about that 8.5 minutes. And then all of a sudden, it would be nighttime. So the longer it takes for light to travel a distance, it's kind of like looking back in time because as we're looking at the sun right now, well, don't look at the sun directly, but you would be looking at the sun as it would look like eight and a half minutes in the past. So really cool concept to keep in mind. But now that we have a nice bird's eye view perspective of our solar system, let's name the planets really quickly. So right in the middle, we have our star, the sun, and then the closest planet to the sun, we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are the rocky terrestrial planets. And then beyond Mars, it kind of looks like an empty space right here, but this is actually quite filled with lots of things. What we have over here is the asteroid belt, and this is what it would look like if we were to highlight all those asteroids. And then beyond the asteroid belt, we have the really big planets. We have the gas giants. We have the Jovians. We've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, the funny one, and Neptune. <laughs> And I can already uh, 
kind of read a few folks' minds. Hey, what about Pluto? I grew up with Pluto. I learned about Pluto. I love Pluto. Viva la Pluto. Well, I can bring Pluto into the mix, folks. I want to bring up Pluto's orbital path. It just appeared on screen. It's represented this nice lighter blue line. And you're going to notice that Pluto has a different trajectory than the other objects I just mentioned. It's not on the same plane. It kind of has its own eccentric tilt orbit. Now, a lot of people tend to ask me, hey, Christian, why did Pluto get kicked out of the Planet Club? I grew up with it. I still consider Pluto a planet. Well, you see, folks, in the mysterious year of the 2006, we got really good about learning about our solar system, specifically this outer part of our solar system called the Kuiper Belt, which is beyond the orbit of Neptune. And you're probably wondering to yourself, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, the Kuiper Belt is all this stuff. Yeah, that is a whole lot of stuff. So out here, we have the Kuiper Belt. This is essentially a second asteroid belt. This is a mostly icy asteroids and a few comets here and there. But in 2006, we found more than 400 objects the same size. Some of them were bigger than Pluto, so we couldn't call all these things planets. There was just way too many of them. So all the astronomers across planet Earth came together to create a, a better way to define a planet. And one of the ways to define a planet is that you need to be so massive uh, that you pretty much push everything else out of your way in your orbital path. Unfortunately for Pluto, it orbits, it, it does like an orbit dance with its own moon, Charon. So it's not the biggest thing in its orbital path. So unfortunately, Pluto is no longer considered a planet, now demoted to a dwarf planet. But don't worry, folks. Uh, Pluto is not the only dwarf planet out here. We've got quite a few of them. We've got Make, Make, and Himea, just to name a couple of them. It's kind of like Pluto said, hey, you kicked me out of your planet club. I want to start my own club, the dwarf planets. But I want to leave, I want to put away the Kuiper Belt, because that's just a lot to look at. And now I'm going to be bringing up some of the space voyagers that we sent out to learn about our solar system in the 1970s. So they should pop up just on screen in just a moment. There they are. So here we have Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, and Pioneer 11, and the newest one, New Horizons which on its way out of our solar system did a quick flyby to take a better images, high definition images of Pluto before it's leave or heading out of our solar system. Now folks, all these things are traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventures, Voyager 1, has not yet traveled as far as light travels in a single day. Now, in order for light to reach all the way out to the orbit of Pluto, that takes about 10 light hours. So nowhere near to a whole day. But we're going to be leaving our solar system. Because now we're going to be leaving the solar system and the planetary scale far behind us. We are now going to be heading into interstellar space, folks. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. And if my calculations are correct, I believe Alpha Centauri is the one, this star closest to us on the right-hand side. So four years at the speed of light, that's about the same amount of time for a college education from freshman year to graduation, at least before the budget cuts. Hee hee hee. <laughs> Y'all are funny. <laughs> but folks, uh, we're going to continue pressing on to uh, a realm much further out. We're going to stop to consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now we're going to be stepping inside the radio sphere. So the radio sphere represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted, or rather leaked into space. And this radio sphere extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting from the Earth. And this first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, radar signal, and then later the detonation of atomic weapons. Now, all these things are emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Now, humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. Since all these signals are electromagnetic, they're traveling at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radio sphere is expanding at the rate of one light year per year, so is anybody out there listening? And folks, I'm going to be bringing up these markers. 
These markers represent some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has one or more planet orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far as to date, we found more than 4,000 exoplanets just in our nearby vicinity, and uh, that number continues to grow because we continue to scan the night sky every night, and we're continuing to find uh, more and more exoplanets, so that number should be increasing steadily in the coming years. Now, in order for us to find Earth-like conditions, that's a whole nother question. Our technology is not yet able to answer that question, but new generations of astronomical instruments are devoted for that search. But the important point here, folks, is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody out there that's able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. For example, if we lived in a star system on the left-hand side of the radio sphere and we want to shoot a message over to an alien civilization on the right side, that could be a good 80-year, uh, just to shoot one message to say hi, takes about 80 years one way. They listen in, answer back another 80 years. That is a 160-year conversation in the making. Whew, and I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. And of course, folks, planetary systems beyond the radio sphere, more than 90 light years away, have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. And for now, folks, I'm going to be putting away these exoplanet markers. And I want to leave our radio sphere up there because that's a nice reference point for us. Because now we're going to start to see the Milky Way and its structure. And personally, for me, I find this the most humbling moment of our show. As huge as mankind's influence on the universe is, our radio sphere is tiny in comparison to our Milky Way galaxy. So keep your eyes on that radio sphere. Let's see if you can still see it. Can you see your house from here? <laughs> just kidding. All righty, folks. So now you can still see the radio sphere just uh, on this far left side of one of the arms of our Milky Way galaxy. And our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to start from one side of the Milky Way and cross it to the other side, it's going to take you 130,000 years to cross that distance at the speed of light. So our Milky Way is about 130,000 light years across. That is a very long road trip. And folks, our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our Milky Way galaxy, I do want to stress the shape of it. When we look at the Milky Way galaxy from a sideways perspective, it kind of looks like a big pancake. But this is really fascinating because when astronomers and scientists want to learn about our universe, it's a lot easier for them to point their equipment or telescopes galactically north or galactically south, so either side of this. Instead of looking through all this gas and debris of the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, which kind of obscures our view of the universe. So keep that in mind. We live in a flat spiral disk of the Milky Way. That's going to come important later on in the show. But the Milky Way is only one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise our known universe. In this giant leap, folks, we're now going to see a view where each point of light represents not a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy, each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. And folks, we live in a local group which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small. It also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And folks, as we start to get a larger picture of all the galaxies around us, you're going to start to notice a, a structure start to appear. You notice that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space, but instead they tend to clump together in clusters with great regions or voids that have very few galaxies. And now, folks, as we continue to zoom on out, we're now seeing a picture that represents the 30,000 closest galaxies to us in a space over 300 million light years across. 
And we've got to give a special shout out and thank you to uh, an amazing person by the names of Brent Tolley, who worked at the University of Hawaii, who compiled this amazing galactic map representation. Thanks to the help of the work of dozens of astronomers, astronomers working over decades of time, they even color coded the densest regions for us. Here in the Morrison, it appears as orange. So anything that's orange, these are dense galaxy clusters. So again, special thanks to Brent Tolley for making this amazing map for us. But now we have automated systems that are even mapping the most distant galaxies. So folks, we are about to see the large scale structure of the universe. All righty, so now we're looking at the large scale structure of the universe. We still continue to see that clumping of galaxies and groups and strands with immense empty regions. By the way, folks, the universe is not shaped like a bow tie. These dark areas that we simply don't see anything, uh, these are areas that we simply haven't mapped out yet. Remember when I told you moments ago that we live in a flat spiral disk? Well, if we were to line up our Milky Way galaxy uh, right in the middle, uh, this is where it would line up in these dark portions. So it's a lot easier for astronomers to look galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through that plane of gas, debris, stars, and planets that kind of obscures our view. Now we were we did do a small survey. We do have a small sample size of galaxies in this dark region, but not too many because again, very difficult to look through all that gas and debris. But as our technology improves, these dark gaps will be eventually filled in. It's only a matter of time. So you can imagine all these galaxies and fill in all those dark regions. So we'll have a nice spread of galaxies in every direction. But folks, uh, we're running close out of time, so we must continue to press on. And now we're going to be looking so far back, we're going to be looking at objects known as the quasars, which are going to be represented in these nice orange dots out here. So these are the quasars, which is short for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these are blazing objects all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So now we're going to look even much more further back beyond the quasars to a time before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. So folks, we're now about to see the very edge of the known universe. And we also like to call this the CMB image, which stands for the Cosmic Microwave Background Image. Now, all evidence indicates that the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is from data compiled by Planck and other automated systems. But this is a picture of a very baby universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And what we're looking at is not a typical photo, but a temperature density image, where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded, where the lighter areas correspond to the hottest, least dense regions, and the darker areas are the coolest, densest regions. But these fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But these very minute differences eventually gave rise to that large scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how this happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us, so we only have one direction left to go, back home. Now, before we make our trip back to planet Earth, I do have to ask you all to prepare yourself because this could possibly be the worst free-falling dream ever. But now that we have a nice entry point, let's make our return trip back to planet Earth now, folks, we're going to be crossing an expanse of 13 billion light years, and we present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart, and we live in a golden age of astronomy. New generations of telescopes and spacecrafts are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for that eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, folks, I want to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders that our universe has to offer. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to peer into their telescopes 
and take a look into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But again, we're making our return trip back to planet Earth. We're entering our Milky Way galaxy. We're making our entry into our radio sphere. We're walking fast, faces past, we're homebound. <laughs> and of course, we're entering our star system, our solar system, folks, the true brightness of our sun as we approach, passing those space voyagers we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system, passing that Kuiper belt, making our way to the third rock from the sun, our home world, our pale little blue dot, our little garden in the vastness of space, the only place humans have ever called home planet earth and as we make our final approach to planet earth folks this is going to be the end of our tour of the universe show and i want to thank you for everybody to stop by and watch this show with me today i did hope you enjoyed it but otherwise we made it back home safe and sound and that's all i have for you today <laughs>